thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity. It's, it's always difficult to be on stage after such an inspiring uh, presentation. And like um, Monty Python said, uh, now it's something completely different. Uh, <laughs> so Ancorena is a cancer company, and, and cancer is, is terrifying and, and terrible as well. Uh, I mean, often cancer is, uh, all cancer is, is terrifying, but some cancers are also terrible in terms of outcome for the patients. And uh, um, kidney cancer that has metastasized is, is one of these terrible diseases. Uh, it affects almost a quarter of a million people worldwide. 80% uh, of the patients are between um, 40 and 69 years of age. Uh, after they have the, the diagnosis and it is clear that the cancer has spread, the time for survival is usually very short, even with the kind of medicines that are available today. It's uh, between one and one and a half year in, in median. Um, and this results in over 100,000 deaths per year uh, worldwide. So it's a terrible, terrible disease. Um, How is it treated currently? Uh, if it's discovered in time, it can be cured with surgery. I mean, if you find the tumor before it has spread, uh, the patients are cured and they are fine, and they can live a, a normal life afterwards. But if it has spread and, and developed metastasis, uh, it's, it's, a big, it's a big problem. Um, there are current uh, treatments, modern treatments, uh, different VEGF inhibitors, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, but they only actually prolong the life uh, with a few months for these patients. Uh, and that to the cost of, of um, big side effects for the patients and also a big cost for society. Uh, worldwide, it's about 10 billion Swedish crowns for, for these treatments. So it's a big need. So what's our proposal? Uh, well, our proposal is that we have a, a unique substance that is, is actively and specifically uh, taken up by cancer cells. It's finding the cancer cells it is accumulated into the cancer cells and, and kills them off. It's a completely new mechanism and, and a, a, a completely new approach. And it is actually a drug substance that humans already has been exposed to, which is, results in, in a risk management uh, for us, because it's, a, it's less of a risk of, of a, uh, completely unknown side effects uh, when we give this to patients. And it's also a, a potentially curative treatment uh, for this otherwise rapidly uh, deadly disease. So what's this wonder treatment that we are proposing? Well, uh, it's based on a substance called orelanin. Uh, as I said, this, this substance is specifically taken up by cancer cells, uh, but it's also taken up by non-cancerous uh, uh, kidney cells. Uh, this means that uh, the patients will, if they have a, a normal kidney function before, uh, they will require dialysis and a subse subsequent uh, transplantation uh, afterwards. Uh, we plan to use the orelanin, giving it as an infusion uh, during two to three weeks over uh, two to three uh, cycles until the tumor uh, burden is gone and the metastasis is gone. Um, a little bit about the substance. As I said, orelanin is, is very selective. It's actively taken up by cancer cells. Um, and this substance, orelanin, actually can be found in a certain type of mushrooms as well. And these mushrooms, uh, you can pick them in the forest right now. Don't do it. Uh, they can be uh, mistakenly um, uh, taken as uh, trattkantareller. Uh, they usually grow in the same places, and uh, I mean, they're not very similar, but they are uh, a little bit close. Um, if you eat too many of these mushrooms, three, four, five, uh, you will lose your kidney function, and you will require dialysis, so don't do it. We are not purifying orelanin from mushrooms. We are uh, producing orelanin in, in, in a synthetic uh, way. It's a small molecule, um, molecular weight 250. So why do we dare to take these into patients? Well, we have done a number of, of studies. Uh, this is just an example of 
some proof of concept studies where we have studied the effect of orelanin in a number of different cancer cell lines, human cell lines from uh, renal cancer. And they are all very sensitive to orelanin. This is the survival and uh, at the concentration here, uh, they will all be dead. In contrast to uh, control cells, uh, which are not affected until you come up to a very high concentration and at higher concentration also uh, only affected in a transient way. So it seems to be specific. It also seems that a number of different cell lines, including cell lines from metastasis, are sensitive to orelanin. So it seems to kill um, different kinds of renal cancer cells. We have also done um, in vivo experiments. Uh, so mice having a human renal cancer tumor, a xenograft. Um, this is untreated animals, and if we treat them, uh, you can see that the tumor is, is, is uh, almost completely gone, and what is left here is mainly dead uh, tumor tissue. So it seems to be very effective also in vivo, in animals, um, in doses that kills cells, kills cancer cells. So what's the current status of our project? We have, over the last year, performed uh, preclinical studies, uh, metabolism, SIP induction, protein binding, and so on. Uh, we had a good meeting with um, regulatory authorities where, where we got advice on what preclinical tests uh, to be done and how we could design uh, the clinical trials. We did a health economic analysis, or not we, but uh, our colleagues uh, at Nordic Health Economics uh, did a good analysis for us, uh, where it shows that uh, this treatment is, is um, most likely uh, considered to be acceptive, ac acceptable uh, in a country like Sweden for such a serious disease. So, um, and we have also produced enough material of orelanin to be able to run uh, the safety uh, regulatory test, the GLP test that uh, will start now during the fall. So, a little bit about the market. As I said, um, these drugs today uh, is, is costing about 10 billion Swedish crowns per year. Uh, the potential uh, patient population in the six major markets uh, worldwide is about 26,000. 26, we will start to use this uh, compound in patients that do not have uh, any kidney function left, that are already in dialysis. So we will test if it works and if it's safe in patients that do not have a kidney function, so we don't risk to uh, affect the kidney function in these patients. And we'll also uh, test it in patients with a poor or intermediate prognosis uh, of, of renal cancer. So the competing R&D pipeline, I won't go in any detail on this. If you look at clinicaltrials.gov, uh, you can find over 200 ongoing uh, clinical trials in, in renal cancer. I've listed uh, some of the mechanisms here. The conclusion is that none of them uh, affect the same mechanism as we are working with. None of them uh, have curative potential, and frankly, none of them have impressive data uh, even. So it's, uh, it's nothing game-changing that we can see in the portfolio right now. A little bit about the history of the project. I thought that would be appropriate since it, it actually shows how a project could progress through this innovation system uh, that we are trying to describe year after year and, and um, have some trouble to do, I think. This started as an academic project in 2004 in Börje Haraldsson and Jenny Nyström's uh, lab here in Gothenburg. And in 2008, uh, it was started as a commercial project with the help of a gear holding. Um, in 2011, Oncorina AB uh, was formed and uh, they secured a Vinova funding that helped to take the project uh, further on. And in 2013, uh, it was incorporated in the PULSE uh, group and was financed with uh, 12 million uh, early 2013. Um, 
And now we are in 2014, and we are having a new investment round of 15 million. So if you have a million or so over, you can contact me afterwards. Uh, the idea is that we will use this 15 million to take the company uh, about one and a half year forward, and that money will, will uh, take us also into the clinic. So we will test this in patients uh, mid next year. Um, and then we plan to uh, partner uh, in 2016 uh, with uh, uh, somebody with more muscles than we that can take this project on uh, through phase three and to the patients that badly need something better. I mentioned that um, uh, we are bringing this forward or we're taking it forward in the Pulse uh, model, uh, in Pulse Invest. And if you are curious about Pulse, you can talk later on to Pontus Ottosson or Klaus Rundberg, who is the CEO and the, the chairman of Pulse. Uh, and they also have a stand outside here. Pulse is, uh, is an organization with six companies right now, and uh, Onkorena is being one of them. Um, Pulse is running the projects in a, in a virtual way. I mean, we have no employees, uh, we don't have an office at the Kungsports Avenue, and we don't have any company cars. Uh, so it's, a, it's an organization consisting of me. Uh, even I'm not employed in the company. Uh, and I'm running this project with the help of uh, competent consultants in Sweden and outside Sweden as well, and using contract labs uh, inside and outside uh, Sweden. So <clears throat> I think this is, a, this is actually a model that, that can help to feed all the consultants uh, that, that are in Sweden, uh, because when Södertälje was closed and when uh, Lund was closed from AstraZeneca, what's the, the, the result is a number of consultancy companies. It's not very many companies actually driving new molecules and driving uh, pharmaceutical projects. And you actually need somebody who's buying these uh, consultants. So you could, you could say that you know, this is, this is a, not a good model because we're not generating any jobs in Sweden, but that's actually not true. Uh, Pulse is, is uh, employing a number of people during a consultancy um, arrangements all over Sweden. And it allows people actually to do what they're best at and doing that just when it's actually needed in the project. So I, I really like to push for this <coughs> virtual model. Uh, um, we have a good network in Pulse um, and good expertise as well. So the team, I won't have any time to go through it. I mentioned uh, Jenny and Börje. Just in the board, we have a, a good combination of preclinical scientists, clinical scientists, and business people. So it's a very good mix of people uh, in the board as well. I'm running it as a CEO. I have a background from AstraZeneca before, uh, a VP of Strategy in Oncology and Infection. Um, so this is my last slide, just to conclude that uh, this is an opportunity actually to provide a long-term survival or even a cure for patients that badly need something better uh, than is on the market today. We have a strong scientific rationale underpinned by exciting experimental data. This is a risk-managed project since we have a compound that actually has been in man already and uh, we're making good progress. So if you have any questions, we can take them now, we can take them outside, or uh, you have my email address there as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. We have actually time for some questions. Do we have any? I can start to just um, ask you that when the pre-clinical the pre trials you did, that was probably a very exciting moment when you got the results from the different... Uh, there are so many things that can go wrong. So uh, did you have yeah. any, you know, solid beliefs before that, or was it just yeah, I mean, one of these things? What, what, is, what is a bit strange and, and in a way disappointing as well is that it's so hard to predict where it's going to go wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's always going to go wrong somewhere. <laughs> exactly. And, and you tend to believe that it's probably going to wrong, go wrong there. And then it, you, you find out that, well, this is fine. All these tests are fine. This is where the problem ends, yeah. uh, starts. So it's, it, it is a bit of a, 
surprise, it's always a bumpy journey. I mean, we're making good progress, uh, but, but with the help of, of very skilled experts, I would say, external experts. But, but I guess the message is that it's, it's very hard to predict where it's going to go wrong. Yeah. And it's always a surprise. Yes, we have a question in the middle here. Thank you for a very inspiring uh, talk here. I'm Stefan Pierro from ESP Life Sciences. I was just wondering, this molecule is known already, so uh, you have to have generated some kind of intellectual property here. Is it in formulations or uh, indication-wise, or could you comment? Yes, so we have, we have patent protection here. Uh, we have uh, IP rights of the use of orelanin in kidney cancer. And this is a, a, a patent that has been granted in the US, Europe, and Japan as well. So we have a, a solid patent protection around it. Thank you. And we have another question over here. Well, <laughs> Chris is here for And um, exciting news, Janne. I'm here. Mm. Ah, <laughs> hello, Chris. <Christa. laughs> and um, <laughs> so in your business model, does it require that the patient survive? I mean, you get a complete remission of the disease. Because if, if you only have a prolonged lifetime, is it acceptable then with a total absent kidney function with all that mess around that? Mm -hmm. it's, 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 a, it's a very good question. And, and it's clear that, that we, this will never survive as a therapy if we get three months on, on top of, of what uh, Avastin and, and Sutent can do. It needs to be much more. Uh, is it one year? Is that okay? Is it two years? Uh, is it cure? I mean, when you, when you talk to oncologists about cure, you realize that very few cancers actually are cured. They pop up five, 10, 15 years later. Uh, it's, it's, uh, so cure is very difficult to define. I mean, it's, it's, it's defined actually as as a, a similar probability of, of lifespan as the normal population, which is very rare. But, but what we could say is that it will require a much longer uh, survival than these few months. But it's difficult to say if it's one year or two years or whatever it is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you.